So today's agenda, um, we're going to start with why, why am I talking about China and Vietnam. Uh, we're then going to talk about reform in China in the period leading up to the 4th of June 1989, which is the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre. Uh, we'll then talk about Tiananmen in the 1990s. Um, that will lead us into a discussion of what I'm calling the sequencing debate of political and economic reform. Once it was clear that communism was going to be replaced by capitalism, there was a huge debate about, well, uh, is it better to have political reform first or economic reform first? Uh, try to do them together. And we'll talk about that uh, sequencing debate, which will lead us into a larger discussion of what since the 1950s has been known as modernization theory, the thesis that economic modernization will eventually produce demand for and the establishment of democracy. And that will then leave us to think about the future. So, China and Vietnam today. China so far has built the equivalent of Europe's entire housing stock in just 15 years. In November 2015, Beijing replaced the substantially larger 1,300-ton San Juan Bridge in just 43 hours. Between 1996 and 2016, China has built 2.6 million miles of roads, including 70,000 miles of highways, connecting 95% of the country's villages and overtaking the U.S. as the country with the most extensive highway system by almost 50%. Over the past decade, China has constructed the world's longest high-speed rail network, 12,000 miles of rail lines that carry passengers between cities at speeds of up to 180 miles per hour. China now has more high-speed rail tracks than the rest of the world combined. So that's one of any number of video clips one could pick, pick to just give a, a snapshot of the incredible uh, transformation of the Chinese economy uh, over the last couple of decades. And indeed, uh, over the, the last decade, uh, I went to, to Beijing last year for the first time in about 12 years. And uh, 12 years ago, uh, you know, the, there were lots of uh, potholes in the streets. There were still uh, rickshaws on the highways. Um, you, go, you go to Beijing today, it's just miles and miles of skyscrapers and uh, every conceivable, um, every conceivable uh, multinational is there. Uh, you, you just, it's, it, it looks like just West Los Angeles times, uh, you know, a, a hundred. Uh, so you, you can't overstate, and I will put some statistics up in a little while, but the, the economic, um, explosion in China since the 1970s has been phenomenal. And then here's another uh, snapshot. This is Vietnam. If you're talking about the 80s, what Vietnam looked like? We go to cities, you didn't see the light, electricity cut, no car in the street. Vietnam was so isolated from the world. With the Doi Moi economic reforms of 1986, the government hoped to move toward what is now called a socialist-oriented market economy. When the Vietnamese government asked for hands-on advice, the IMF did not refuse the call. Nếu như vào những cái thời kỳ đầu của những năm đổi mới, thì IMF có cái vai trò hỗ trợ về nguồn lực tài chính để mà giúp Việt Nam thực hiện cái cải cách nền kinh tế. If you use the analogy. Uh, Vietnam's economy as a eagle flying up. There are two wings. One is internal institutional reform, and the other is opening to trade. Free to start their own companies, the Vietnamese people created more than 30,000 private businesses in the first 10 years, spurring growth that averaged 7% throughout the 1990s. If you look back in the late 80s and early 90s, we had the first FDI law ever. 
which opened up the opportunity for newly established private firms to engage in international trade. And that was complemented with a major push to attract foreign direct investment into Vietnam. The economy has grown at about 7% per year since 1990, second globally only to China. So the, these are the two most successful examples of post, uh, post-communist systems that have remained authoritarian but have been uh, transforming their economies into uh, capitalist arrangements. And um, that differentiates them from the other post-communist systems that have retained authoritarian rule. If we think about North Korea or we think about Cuba, they have not uh, transformed their economies. So the, the, this is one uh, thing that differentiates them from the other uh, post-communist authoritarian uh, systems, post-communist economies retaining communist authoritarian political systems. And they account for a large part of the economic success in the world in the last decade. Just to take uh, one or two decades, just to take one example, one of the, one of the, the one of the encouraging stories of our time is if you, if you take the long view of things, uh, the number of extreme number of people and even the percentage of the population, both living in extreme poverty, has really gone down uh, over the past two centuries. And much of, that, um, much of that decline has come in the last few decades. Of course, this is a worldwide indicator. Um, but if you look at where is, what, what is accounting for most of this decline, you can see that the main action has been in, in East Asia. So uh, the, this is the blue line up here where uh, poverty, uh, again, this is the number of people living on a less than $1.25 a day, which is the World Bank's definition of extreme poverty. So uh, most of the changes, of course, have come in the developing world. Uh, but if you compare East Asia, for example, uh, to Africa, uh, it, East Asia is um, by far the lion's share of the re reduction in extreme poverty. Now, of course, not all of that is, the, is China and Vietnam. Uh, there are countries like South Korea uh, that have uh, massively uh, improved. Uh, there are other countries in that part of the world, uh, not to mention Singapore, uh, where poverty rates have decreased massively. Nonetheless, uh, China and Vietnam are relatively impressive stories on this front as well. Uh, this is a, a picture of reductions in poverty in Vietnam. And if I'd had uh, gone back before 2010, the numbers would have, you know, they would have been higher up there as well. But you can see, even in this last difficult decade, uh, and despite the fact that ethnic minorities within Vietnam are not doing uh, as well as, as others, we're seeing uh, very low rates of people living in poverty in Vietnam. China, uh, you can see um, the, the headcount living below the official poverty line is, is the red line. The, the headcount below uh, 1.9 US dollars a day uh, is the green line. Again, you can see massive reductions in poverty by many estimates, the, the, they vary, but many estimates uh, say that since the, since the reforms in China ushered in in the late 1970s, somewhere between 400 million and half a billion people have moved out of poverty. Um, now, there's another line on this chart, which I don't believe, which is the Gini coefficient, which measures, is a measure of inequality. And I don't believe, uh, I believe that the inequality in China has gone up a good deal more. If you look at um, uh, here, this is comparing the top and bottom quintile, but again, this is 
data provided by the Chinese government. You can see that the, in terms of per capita income, they're showing an increase in inequality from three times to about eight times. Um, and uh, land and consumption, less of a change. So I would just say two things about these statistics that, uh, and the reason, they, these, are come, these are based on Chinese government statistics. My guess is the, that the uh, in, inequality in China is a, is a lot higher, and particularly this is, this is comparing quintiles, that's a top 20%. But just as in the US and just as in many other capitalist countries that we'll talk about later in the course, if you look at the top 5%, the top 1%, or the top 0.1%, you're gonna see massive increases in inequality. And that puts on the table a dilemma that's going to be worth thinking about as we progress through the course and talk about some other countries, which is that um, while inequality within countries, just about anywhere in the world, has gone up over the last four decades, worldwide global inequality has actually come down, and the number of people living in poverty has come down dramatically, as we've seen. But if you, if you read, say, the Millennium Goals, or you go to the World Economic Forum meetings, which I have done from time to time, you'll see politician after politician and policy wonk after policy wonk standing there saying, we need policies to reduce poverty and inequality. It's like almost one word. Poverty and inequality is one word. But this is what we're seeing here is something that's going to come back to us in, in multiple ways during the course. It's not obvious that all good things go together. And it may well be the case that the price of reducing inequality, the uh, price of reducing poverty, is tolerating uh, significant increases in inequality. We have to think about those trade-offs in various settings. In any event, in both China and in Vietnam, you've seen massive decreases in poverty, uh, big increases in inequality, in not as high by most measures in Vietnam. Again, though, it's hard to know uh, what statistics to believe on these matters, uh, but most scholars seem to think there's less inequality in Vietnam than in China. So the, the first answer why are we talking about China and Vietnam today is that by virtually any measure, they have been economically successful. Um, but then the second and in some ways more interesting reason we're going to look at them is they challenge a lot of accepted wisdom about capitalism, democracy, and the relations between them. Because here we have two very repressive authoritarian systems transforming their economies into successful capitalist ones. So uh, that's the puzzle we're going to be wrestling with for the rest of today's class uh, in one form or another. So um, let's think about what was happening in China before Tiananmen. After Mao's death, um, in, in 1978, things were going to change very rapidly. Uh, just to give you a sense, up until the end of the Cultural Revolution in China, this is, this is a picture comparing uh, Chinese and Japanese per capita GDP. Uh, and as you can see, this is a period of explosive uh, economic growth in Japan after World War II, of course from a very low uh, base because their whole economy had been destroyed. It's a little, when people talk about the Japanese miracle, it's a little bit misleading. If, if we took this back to, you know, 1925, uh, th this not line would have come down because of the, the collapse produced during the war. So it's not from, it's a recreation to some degree of what had existed before uh, the war, but nothing like the levels uh, that were developed, uh, that were seen in the, in the years after the war. But as you can see, per capita GDP in China was basically flat. Uh, there was no uh, economic development to speak of. 1978, Mao is now dead. 
the third plenum of the uh, Communist Party Central Committee, then Vice Premier, soon to be Premier, uh, Deng Xiaoping, calls for officials to, to start liberating their thinking, to, to start seeking truth from facts. Uh, I, an ironic statement, perhaps, in light of our own discussions of fake news and, and uh, manipulation of the truth uh, that we're coping with today. But, but to innovate and experiment in, in the economy. And um, officials were ex instructed, this is when they started, uh, you know, China had been very closed and inward looking, and they, they began uh, going in large numbers abroad. They started uh, applying for courses at places like uh, you know, MIT uh, Business School. Uh, they started trying to learn from other development models, and this is going to be the beginning of experimentation uh, with new forms of capitalism. This is also when uh, the, the big special economic zones in China were created, these, these massive um, uh, Islands of experimenting with capitalism, if you like. Most, most of the world's special economic zones, and we'll talk a, a bit more about them uh, in other countries later, are, are sort of industrial parks. Uh, they are um, you know, 40 or 50 company firms. Uh, they get some preferential tax treatment, and the idea is to attract foreign capital. The ones being set up in China uh, were enormous. They would sort of giant cities with schools and shops, and people lived in them in their entire lives. And the idea was to experiment uh, with capitalist economics uh, in self-contained ways. Um, this is also when they start opening up to foreign direct investment. This is when companies like Cummins, truck engines, come to China. One of the biggest multinationals in China today started uh, in, the, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And so this seemed to be uh, a little bit like the Prague Spring. Um, and indeed, in the late 1970s, people started talking about the Beijing Spring. Um, and there was much more criticism of the government, tolerated, uh, people started publishing uh, things that you would have been thrown in prison for uh, five years earlier, or even three years earlier, and uh, there, there was something of a thaw. There was something called the democracy wall uh, in, in the Xidan district of Beijing was created, a kind of, a kind of graffiti wall, if you like, on which uh, people published criticisms of the government. But um, the, the vast majority of the political criticism was backward looking. It was criticism of the Cultural Revolution, criticism of Mao, criticism of what had been done in the past, mistakes that had been made in the past. Um, and of course, that wasn't going to stay that way. And so before long, uh, the Democracy Wall protesters uh, started shifting their, their attention from uh, attacking the past to attacking the current leadership in China. Um, uh, and again, a, a, uh, a lot of demands now for more democracy. Um, Wei Jinsheng was a protester who uh, came out and made very strong criticisms of the government. And uh, this went on until uh, late 1980, early 1981, and then there was a lot of pushback from the regime. And so much of the 1980s were this, this era of testing, political testing, by student movements. There, was, there were organization of student groups on Chinese campuses. Um, there was um, uh, a lot of criticism of the government interspersed with pushback. So Deng came out and made very clear that when he was talking about experimentation with reform, he was talking about economic reform. He was not talking about reforming the political system. And he reaffirmed 
what he called uh, party rule and the socialist par path. He focused on technical questions. His four modernizations had to do with agriculture, uh, the industrial economy, the military, and technology, technological innovation. They started uh, uh, attacking what they called spiritual pollution. There was an anti-spiritual pollution campaign in 1983. And there was an anti-bourgeois liberalization campaign in 1987. And uh, Hu Yaobang, was, who had been a, a, a member of the Central Committee, uh, who had been one of the most energetic reformers, was actually fired uh, from the Central Committee of the Communist Party. So it was, it was this period of back and forth, but a lot of growing protests nonetheless in the 1980s. Um, and it was also a time when the economy wasn't doing that well, particularly for consumers in urban areas. We saw a lot of inflation, and that led to austerity uh, programs, cutbacks on, on spending by the government, which produced further uh, escalation of protest, although the economic reforms continued. Um, so if you look at at foreign direct investment in China, you can see it starts, it's, it's very low there, but it's going to accelerate um, dramatically over the 1990s. So then uh, in, 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 in 1989, in the summer of 1989, if somebody had said, where is, um, where is there going to be political reform it would have been a pretty good bet, especially given what was going on in Eastern Europe, it would have been pretty, a pretty good bet that there was going to be significant reform in China. The student groups were active, just as in, in, uh, in, in many European countries. Um, and this erupts in 19, of of June 1989. Perhaps, Perhaps as many as, as a half, half a million, million even, even more. In the, in the history, history of communist China, China there, there has never been anything like this. this. For, the For the first time, time in huge numbers, numbers the ordinary men and women of Beijing, Beijing the old and the young, young professors and, and taxi drivers, drivers have, joined have joined the student protest, protest lending their support to what has now taken on all the appearances of a peaceful popular uprising against the oppressiveness of communist rule. As, As the, the afternoon, afternoon wears, wears on here, the crowd gets, gets bigger and bigger, and bigger hoping, hoping that this protest uh, will, will produce, produce results, that the, that the government will respond to the students' demand for meaningful dialogue, and, and begin, begin, begin to implement the kind of genuine reforms as opposed to cosmetic reforms that, that the students want. So these protests were, were going on, and uh, it, was, it soon became clear that the regime was not going to tolerate them, and tanks started appearing in Tiananmen Square. So that, that's not that different from the video we were looking at outside the White House in Russia when, when uh, Gorbachev climbed, uh, when uh, Yeltsin climbed the tank. And it, there was the uh, real expectation among many of the protesters that the Chinese army would not attack its own citizens. Uh, and 
there certainly were appeals going out uh, to that effect, but they turned out that they were wrong. The noise of gunfire rose from all over the center of Peking. It was unremitting. On the streets leading down to the main road to Tiananmen Square, furious people stared in disbelief at the glow in the sky, listening to the sound of shots. Heading down the road was a hazardous business, but hundreds of people cheered as buses were set alight and army trucks caught fire too. They yelled and shouted, and then as troop lorries were seen moving down the road, there was gunfire from those lorries. Troops have been firing indiscriminately, but still, there are thousands of people on the streets who will not move back. The bicycle rickshaws scooped up the injured. Others were shunted onto bikes and pedaled to hospital. Many were carried away by frantic local residents. There was confusion and despair among those who could hardly credit that their own army was firing wildly at them. Young people were singing the Internationale to a background of gunfire. After hours of shooting and facing a line of troops, the crowd is still here. They're shouting, stop the killing and down with the government. A huge volley of shots just as I left the front line caused panic. The young man in front of me fell dead. I fell over him. Two others were killed yards away. Two more people lay wounded on the ground near me. In the streets, many came up to us, shaking with anger and disbelief and fear. Many were terrified, saying there would be retribution. There was not one voice on the streets which did not express despair and rage. Tell the world, they said to us. So that was the beginning uh, of a massive crackdown, huge numbers of people. We never really got uh, statistics we believed as to the number of people were killed at Tiananmen, but it was uh, very large numbers of people were killed. Huge numbers of people were imprisoned after that uh, massive political crackdown. And um, in sharp contrast, again, this is June of 1989, when the, uh, the uh, revolutions all over Eastern Europe, the thaw is going on, the Soviet Union is, is not intervening in the liberalization movements in Eastern Europe. And of course, uh, five months later, the wall came down in Germany. But China went a very different path, that uh, the massive political repression of this dissent. Um, but it did not stop the economic reforms and the economic transformation. And as you can see here, um, the, uh, this is just foreign direct investment in China. It, it just, uh, throughout the 1990s, it increases. The fact that it's decreasing as a share um, of uh, Chinese GDP tells you how much the economic, uh, the domestic economy is developing as well. Uh, so that uh, even though as, a, as a, in, uh, in absolute numbers foreign direct investment is going up uh, by leaps and bounds, it's a declining share of the growing Chinese economy, which is becoming a powerhouse. Um, and here you can see the, the uh, astonishing growth rates that have been recorded in China uh, since 19. Uh, since 1989, uh, you can see by 1991, they were recording already um, double-digit growth rates, and they have been uh, uh, the highest growth rates in the world uh, virtually every year since. Um, if you look at um, manufacturing in China, and we'll talk more about manufacturing, uh, this is between 2006 and 2016. Um, as you know, modest increases in, in the U.S. and Japan, uh, just um, threefold increase in manufacturing in in, in China, uh, just just uh, absolutely dramatic industrial takeoff. Comparable story on a smaller scale, 
uh, about Vietnam transforms itself from a, an extremely poor country uh, into uh, an, a, a very successful middle income economy. It's still, uh, it, it, the, it's still, I think it's the fifth largest economy in East Asia, but it is uh, second only to China in terms of economic growth. So uh, they, these huge success stories, and they have been studied to death. There have been armies of scholars uh, trying to understand the reasons for this success. And in the readings I gave you, you get some sense of the variety of explanations that are out there that are trying to account for the dramatic success uh, in China and Vietnam. And um, most of these explanations suffer from what economists and political scientists refer to as the pathology of selecting on the dependent variable. That is, Everybody focuses all of their attention on China and Vietnam and trying to look for characteristics that explain the outcome. But of course, that's not how you do social science. You have to think about the independent variable because uh, if you select only on the dependent variable, namely in this case economic success, you may be missing um, what's really causing it by looking, not seeing other countries that have done the same things that have not succeeded. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, Alexander Gershenkron was famous for the idea that late developers have an advantage. They have an advantage because they don't have to necessarily go through all the stages. This is sort of the opposite of a first mover advantage, which we talked about, about in tariffs in, in the EU. So the idea is that late developers can skip some of the stages. You look in, in Africa, you can create a banking system without banks today because uh, people can do banking on their cell phones, right? They don't have to go through all the stages. So that this, this is one, so these were relatively late developers. Well, they were relatively late developers, but there are plenty of relatively late developers that haven't had this kind of success all over all over Africa, all in much of Latin America, uh, elsewhere in East Asia. So the fact of being a late developer alone is obviously not the advantage. Um, they, were, they were predominantly rural at the start. Um, and that, that they, the, so the, the argument, this is in the Malevsky in London, uh, paper, the fact that they didn't have inefficient urban economies to dismantle. Um, this is, uh, they didn't have a big inefficient uh, economies to dismantle, made it easier that as they urbanized, they urbanized in relatively efficient ways. Again, there are many, um, many predominantly uh, agrarian countries that have not, uh, that have not been as successful as them. People point to Confucian values. Um, you know, Confucianism, uh, above everything else, values order. So they say, oh, well, it's, it's Confucian values. But of course, there are countries with Confucian values that have not been particularly successful economically. The most obvious and dramatic illustration being uh, North Korea. Uh, Confucian values haven't done anything for the North Korean economy. Uh, education. Both China and Vietnam have made huge investments in education. They're making bigger investments, for example, than we are making in education. Uh, K through 12 education, but also technical education, science education. Uh, the few things to say about that, most of the investments in education have become, have, have come later after the economic takeoff, but also there are countries, you know, Russia is an extremely well-educated population. Uh, countries, uh, Ethiopia has now uh, got every child in school. Uh, they're one of the first African countries to have such high levels of K through 12 education, but they have not been replicating this success. There was a less entrenched command communist system. Uh, the Malevsky in London piece makes some, uh, have some 
put, put a lot of credence in this idea that in the, the Soviet economy, for example, was this massively uh, inefficient but deeply entrenched communist economic system that uh, once they started to dismantle it, the whole economy fell apart. China and uh, Vietnam, partly because they were uh, mainly rural uh, economies at the, in, the, in the 1970s, didn't have these big entrenched uh, communist economic command economies that had to be dismantled. They, they involved gradual reform. They did not, uh, uh, and we'll come back to this in more detail in a, few, in a few minutes, but they did not simply replace the communist system with, the, with a capitalist system. In the Soviet Union, there was no choice because the communist system itself just imploded. It just collapsed. It became completely dysfunctional. And so they were starting from ground zero. In both China and Vietnam, there was a, a, a gradual experimental approach, as I've already uh, mentioned in China in the special economic zones, opening their economies to foreign direct investment, uh, which enabled um, uh, the, the creation of joint ventures with foreign firms um, and uh, allowed uh, the economy to grow in particular sectors, uh, not trying to reinvent uh, wholesale a new system. Uh, experimentalism and decentralization, they devolved a lot of power to make decisions about economic performance to regions, provided that they delivered uh, what was required by the central government, there was much less micromanaging uh, from the center of how uh, the different um, economic enterprises were run and how uh, local officials met their goals. Again, uh, putting uh, less demand on the central leadership to um, know what to do in every circumstance when very often they didn't know what to do and they knew that they didn't want, didn't know what to do. Um, competition within the state sector and between the state sector and the private sector. So they created um, big state-owned enterprises, particularly in China, but they introduced competition among them and they required them to compete in the private sector and they require and they um, they shut down inefficient state companies. It's it should be said that it's it's very difficult to uh, get a grip on the ch the differences between the state sector and the private sector. That means very much in China, um, partly because many of the the many of the private sector companies get funding from state banks but also because many of the top leadership of private sector firms are members of the Communist Party uh, and have to be members of the Communist Party. And so that, you know, that raises the question, well, they might be nominally private, but what does it mean in terms of their influenceability by the party? On the other hand, uh, the flip side of that is that it means that this, the leadership of the Communist Party is hearing a lot about the needs of business all the time because there are many business people, business leaders are in the Communist Party and um, making the case for what they need. Um, so the, the, the system is, is relatively competitive for a, a state sector dominated economy. Export oriented growth model, uh, again, the, this is uh, pointed to uh, by many scholars that this, this export basic producing uh, for foreign markets, uh, manufacturing goods for foreign markets has been extremely successful. There are many other countries in the world, again, that have uh, produced for foreign markets that have not been as successful. Um, Relatively good accountability and the rule of law. So um, 
The, the system of accountability, it's interesting, in China, while you can't attack people for political reasons, you can attack officials for being inefficient and corrupt. Uh, and that has usually been the, the uh, path by which people have pushed uh, for accountability and reform. Yu Ha Wang, in the chapter I, in, I, I um, put in, in with the readings uh, from his book, T T Tying the Autocrat's Hands, points out that the, there's been a pretty effective increase in the demand for the rule of law with respect to commercial matters, not political matters, commercial matters, in the sectors of the economy that are dominated by foreign investment. And the reason he gives, and I think it's, it's uh, plausible, the reason he gives is that uh, domestic uh, firms have access to elites to solve their problems through informal networks, the so-called um, Guangxi relationships that they build. Uh, di distinguishing Guangxi from corruption is often uh, easier said than done, but they have access to informal dispute resolution mechanisms, whereas the foreign firms do not. And so the, the parts of the economy in which the foreign firms are big have been where there's been a lot of demand for the creation of courts to resolve disputes. Um, and uh, Wang, who's a, a very impressive political scientist at Harvard, uh, makes the case that it's this demand for the rule of law as a condition for attracting foreign investment that has fed that development. Of course, the, the subtitle of his book is uh, uh, um, Tying the Autocrat's Hand, something, and, and the rise of the rule of law in China. I was recently at a panel with him where he said, maybe we should now be talking about the rise and decline of the rule of law in China because as that earlier shy slide showed you, uh, foreign investment is becoming a less important part of the Chinese economy. So the, to the extent that the demand for the rule of law is coming from the foreign investment sector, it might be uh, diminishing. Leadership. So leadership, several people have noticed that if you look at authoritarian systems, um, the one way to classify them is that those that have managed to renew themselves will find mechanisms of renewal versus those that have not. So um, if you think about the Arab monarchies in the Middle East, they essentially, you know, they stagger on until the king dies, pretty much. That's what happens in monarchies. Or, you know, dictatorships in Africa and Latin America, they stagger on until the dictator dies, um, you know, or and even in, in the Middle East, you know, Assad is followed by his son. You get another Assad. Um, and this is true in some of the, the, non, the communist authoritarian systems like um, North Korea, you know, King Jong-il, King Jong-un, you know, uh, just, uh, again, you have, you have aging, ossifying leaderships that don't manage to renew themselves and so kind of drag the country into the abyss uh, as they become geriatric. Whereas some authoritarian systems seem to have come up with mechanisms to renew themselves. And this, if, if, you, said, if, if you said to m most people, maybe most people in this room, who are the leaders of Vietnam? Most people would have no idea who they are. It's a, it's a triumvirate. Uh, they, they do get replaced over time. Or you think about Burma. Uh, again, th there's no cult of personality. The, these, are, these are countries in which they have renewed themselves. Uh, and in China, um, after Mao, it seemed like they had really figured out a way to avoid uh, the trap of charismatic leaders. Um, indeed, uh, uh, Bo Xi Lai had been a, a member of the Communist Party who was quite charismatic and a, uh, some years ago uh, was kicked out and thrown in prison. Uh, and his, his wife had alleged to be involved in a murder. Many Western scholars interpreted that as he was too charismatic and the Chinese didn't want 
they tried charisma, they saw where it went with Mao, and they, they were into this model where people would not, uh, not be able to uh, be at the helm for more than a decade. And it, so it seemed like, to the extent that you need young, vigorous leadership, that countries like China and Vietnam had solved this problem, which is hard for authoritarian systems to do, uh, because there's no automatic mechanism of renewal. Um, and if a charismatic figure comes along, it's very difficult uh, to get them out. Uh, so that was another reason people pointed to. So this is, I think, 11 reasons you could pull out of those review essays. Uh, and no doubt, people could come up with more. Um, and the truth is, nobody knows. There's no silver bullet here. It's, uh, the, there are some combinations of these things. There are things like luck. Um, but these are uh, out there as the main explanations for why uh, these, these countries have been so successful. Right? It, it then puts on the table the question, well, how sustainable is this success? Um, should we be expecting it to continue going forward? And uh, can we have long-term successful capitalist authoritarianism. This, if you like, is the question put on the table um, by uh, the, the success of these countries now over a period of two decades uh, beyond the wildest dreams economically of uh, any observer and maybe anybody even in those countries along with very repressive political regimes. And, um, so how to think about that? Well, there's some questions to wonder about with respect just to the economies. One is um, that since 2008, we have seen a resurgence in the growth of the state sectors of these economies. This is partly, as I intimated at, right at the beginning of today's lecture, that now that the Washington consensus is in bad odor, People are now talking about the Beijing consensus. Until 2008, China made no attempt to export its development model elsewhere. They were kind of back on their heels uh, about uh, uh, the Washington consensus. That is no longer true. Uh, not only has the state sector in, in the Chinese economy expanded, they are now training uh, people from many developing countries in economic management pushing a very different uh, model of state-led growth um, from the model that um, was being pervaded in the Washington consensus. And, uh, and to the extent that the state sector is going to be less efficient, that raises questions about how sustainable these growth rates are. Um, because even though relatively efficient, uh, compared to other command economies, um, they're less efficient than the private sector uh, in those countries and elsewhere. Then there's what um, Steinfeld in, in that Playing Our Game book that I put on there calls the smile curve of profitability. And so this is, this is the idea which he actually takes from somebody called Stan Shi. Um, this is the idea that if you look at, if you look at um, where the, the biggest profitability in manufacturing comes from, most of it is either at the R&D phase, uh, research and development uh, upstream, or it's in the manufacturing and marketing downstream. If you think about where is the, where is the money made out of an iPhone? Right? It's, it's people who come up with the basic technologies make a lot of money, and then the people who put it together do the marketing make a lot of money. So the solid curve here, what it's telling you is that the manuf there's not that much money to be made in the manufacturing. This is just low wage labor. You know, and these are these people working on assembly lines. That's not the source of great profitability, but that has been where uh, most of the economic action has been in these economies. The dotted line is that uh, Realizing that, the, the Chinese have started to try and, and move further, further 
uh, up the smiley curve in both directions. So they've tried to get more involved in research and development and more involved in uh, mar marketing uh, and, and sales. But of course, they do that largely by imitating, sort of creating, if you like, generic versions, uh, copying technologies and then copying marketing methods. And if you do that, that tends to move. It, it means everybody else can do it too. Uh, and so you, if you like, are sawing off the branch you're sitting on. And so it's not clear that they're going to be able to continue uh, to be profitable. Um, picking winners. Uh, economists always criticize central planning because governments pick winners, and governments don't know how to pick winners. They don't know what are going to be uh, the successful parts of the economy. That is less of a problem in the early stages of industrialization. You know what you have to do. You have to build cities. You have to build roads. You have to build housing. You have to put in electricity. You have to put in water. Once you get into complex economies, it's very much more difficult to know where the successful innovations are going to be and where they're not going to be. And so the governments might start to make a lot of bad bets. Uh, as, as uh, governments often do when they start to pick winners. So as, as growth becomes more complex, it becomes less likely that you're going to have uh, even relatively efficient political leaderships pick, successfully keep picking winners in the economy. Changing leadership and corruption. The story I told uh, about China's leadership in the last five years seems to have gone out the window. Uh, so now, uh, as uh, Donald Trump complains, Xi Jinping might be there for life. Um, and uh, Trump's clearly somewhat envious about that idea. But um, uh, the, the, t the 10 year term limit has now been abandoned at his request, He's, and he is a very charismatic figure, uh, certainly the most uh, powerful uh, Chinese leader since Mao. And so it may well be that the, the mechanism for ensuring leadership re renewal uh, is breaking down, or has perhaps even broken down. In Vietnam, they had a, almost a separation of power system uh, with different leaders responsible for different parts of the political and legal system. And that also seems to be breaking down, or at least under strain, from reports that it's possible to get. I already mentioned Yu Ha Wang's point that uh, to the extent that the rule of law in the economy uh, was dependent on demand from the foreign sector, that might be going away as foreign investment as a proportion of the Chinese economy is actually shrinking. And given the trade wars are coming, that we are now in, they might be shrinking a lot further than we talked about before. And so that plus the leadership changes might mean that we're going to see increases in corruption again, inefficient uh, management, different forms of corruption. Then the, the next thing, and this is going to now, we're going to start transitioning to talking about politics, is that when you create big industrial workforces working on assembly lines, eventually they start to make demands. They start to want higher wages. And this is uh, um, so-called flying geese theory of economic development. This is the idea that capital is going to go to wherever labor is cheapest. Um, and so, if you look uh, here, this, these, these are wages in uh, China, Mexico, and Vietnam. What you can see is that, uh, you know, since the beginning of this century, wages in China have gone up quite dramatically. Uh, and they're now uh, substantially above wages in Mexico and wages in Vietnam, which, while they've gone up, uh, have gone up nowhere near as much. And so uh, if you look at this is called the labor cost index, which basically measures the cost of producing one unit of output, um, 
you can see that there too, uh, the cost of labor has gone up in China quite dramatically uh, during this century. Um, and that has meant that the geese are flying out of China. Uh, they're flying to places where labor is cheaper. Um, this is the Nike plant in Ho Chi Minh City, which I visited in March of 2001. Uh, it was uh, run by a, China, a, a Vietnamese management company uh, with about 20,000 Vietnamese women working in it there. The whole thing consisted of, it looked like uh, four giant football stadiums. This is about an hour's drive outside of Ho Chi Minh City, which used to be um, Saigon. Uh, it, it looks like four giant football fields, but all of them built out of aluminum. You can see they could be packed up and put into a, um, you know, into a bunch of planes and flown off to somewhere else uh, at relatively low cost. And here are some of the people working. What, what strikes you about these, these pictures? Um, what's notable about these pictures? Yeah. They're all women, yeah, uh, all, all women, and the management, and they're all Vietnamese. The management are all Taiwanese and all men, by the way, almost all men. Not, yeah, what else is striking? I don't know if the picture's quite captured. It's, it's incredibly labor intensive. This, this, these machines look like they're 20 or 30 years old. Um, making a Nike running shoe is, is split into about you know, 35 different tests. One person is cutting the little pieces one into the cut with a cutting machine. One person's putting glue on. One, you know, they, they, it's an unbelievably labor intensive because labor is so cheap. Uh, that, after all, is why they went there. And indeed, um, I spent the day there and walking around with a mid-level manager. And uh, I asked him his personal history. And he said, uh, he said, well, I used to manage a plant like this in China. So I, I said, well, what's the biggest difference between managing a plant like this in China and managing a plant like this in Vietnam? And it, the answer was, the Vietnamese argue less and work harder. Um, and I'm sure that was exactly true, because the Chinese workers had been doing this kind of work for longer. Uh, and they had, uh, diff you know, had started developing aspirations. And so, so Nike had moved the plant to Vietnam. And so the, I the idea would be that of the flying geese theory that um, eventually demands for higher wages will cause the geese to fly. Um, and uh, you know, Vietnam will get this benefit for a while, but then uh, the geese will fly to uh, Cambodia or wherever the next place is, or maybe uh, Zimbabwe. Now, this is also um, exacerbated in the coming economy by the, the probability that a lot of these jobs are going to eventually be going to technology. That, that is, the technology is going to become so cheap uh, that it will no longer be worth it to pay even uh, starvation wages, and so the geese might stop flying altogether. Um, but it's, it's again going to put stress on economies that are dependent a lot uh, on manufacturing for feeding their populations. Um, slowing growth and regime legitimacy. A lot of people have argued uh, that the legitimacy of these regimes depends upon uh, they're delivering growth. Yes, they don't have elections, so they don't have political accountability, but people have been satisfied because the standard of living has been going up, they've been doing a lot better economically, they've become, uh, they're employed and they, they have prospects, have had prospects for upward mobility. As growth slows in these economies, which almost every economic projection predicts that it will, 
that's going to become harder and harder to sustain, and so you're going to get pressure um, and maybe resurgence of political dissent, and there are going to be strains on those economies. So despite the many reasons that people cite for the success, there are reasons also to wonder how sustainable these models might be. And this leads us to thinking about the relationships between political and economic reform. Um, during the transition in Eastern Europe in 1989, uh, people started worrying a lot about this. And uh, this was the these were the debates about shock therapy. You know, should we have a dramatic reform right away, get the pain over with, and then do political reform, or should we do political reform first or do them in tandem? And I put three people up here because they are ideologically from very different places. Adam Shavorsky is a former Marxist. Uh, he wrote a book called Democracy in the Market in 1991. Hannes Kornai, The Road to a Free Economy, is a riff off um, Hayek's Road to Serfdom. So he was a kind of libertarian. And Jeff Sachs was a kind of middle of the road policy wonkish economy. Uh, but they all made the same argument, which was essentially this. If you, if you, think, about, uh, if you think about an a collapsing communist economy, um, as the old system is dismantled, uh, eventually people are going to be thrown into distress. And it's going to get so bad, think you're going to per capita income is going to fall below the poverty line. Eventually, things will get better, yeah. But if, what if you democratize here? Then all of these people are going to be angry, and they're going to use their democratic rights to stop the reforms. And so instead of turning the corner, um, you're going to just keep crashing down. And so the, the shock therapy people said, no, uh, let's, let's not democratize until this point. Uh, once the worst economic pain has been experienced. Um, so these technocrats had the same kind of hubris as we were talking about last time. They really thought uh, that they understood uh, everything about market economies, but they got a lot of things wrong. Um, for example, both paths have turned out to be successful. If you compare Poland that had shock therapy with the Czech Republic that went with gradualism. They've both been they're among the two most successful former communist economies in Eastern Europe. Um, uh, of course, Poland's four times the size and, and so on, but they, they both have had very successful development paths. Uh, so it's not clear it made that much difference. The other thing that it ignores, and this is really important, it's not only the losers from reform who mobilize, it's the winners who mobilize as well. The people who get things out of the reforms don't want things to, to uh, go away. And so it's far from obvious that democratizing while you're doing economic development is only going to empower the people who want to stop it. On the contrary, it might actually help economic reform go along. Um, the e economic advantages of gradualism um, get lost. So uh, one of the big secrets of success in China and Vietnam was this two-track pricing system where they created a second economy next to the state sector, not instead of the state sector. So basically people were told, if you can produce to, at the government set price, uh, what your quota is required, you, on top of that you can produce as much as you want and sell it at market prices. And so that was the way, one of the ways in which a market economy was created alongside the socialist sector and didn't depend upon its destruction. Uh, those are the kind of advantages you forego when you go for, um, when you go for shock therapy. And this leads to a, a broader set of questions about modernization that I just want us to end with, which is that the, the old modernization theorists said that economic development would produce, inevitably produce demands from, for democracy. And I'm giving here one just 
you can find a million statements like this. But here the person's saying, the effects of socioeconomic change, rising literacy, income, and urbanization rates, along with the improvements of com communications, uh, technologies reduce the cost of collective action, delegitimize the autocratic rule, and foster demands for greater democracy. As a result, authoritarian regimes, which have, have a relatively easy time ruling, ruling poor and agrarian societies, find it increasingly difficult and ultimately impossible to maintain their rule once socioeconomic development reaches a certain level. That was a scholar talking about China five years ago. Um, the trouble with modernization theory is that the logic is very unclear. Why exactly is modernization going to produce a demand for democracy? And if you, if you sort of troll through it, you find at least three arguments there. So the, the most famous one, first made famous by Barrington Moore, was that it's all about the bourgeoisie. No bourgeoisie no democracy, and I've mentioned some other modernization theorists there. And so there the thinking seemed to be that as you got a, a middle class, a middle class is going to want bourgeois freedoms. They're going to want to be able to travel. They're going to want their kids to have opportunities. Uh, and so they're going to put pressure on the regime to change. Um, Nonetheless, if, if the bourgeoisie are getting everything they want, it's not obvious that they're really going to demand changes, particularly if their lifestyles are improving. There's certainly no inexorable logic why that might happen. Um, so then a second variant, this really goes back to Marx and Engels, but I put up some more recent scholars of it. It's not about the bourgeoisie, it's about the working class. It's the working class, no working class, no democracy. And, and you've got to have an industrial working class that is going to get angry as its relative and perhaps absolute position eventually de deteriorates, and they're going to demand. So it's going to be pressure from below. Um, and so th this is what the, these scholars argue in different ways. And then a third group of scholars say, actually, it's all about war. That when governments fight wars, what they need is people to pay for the wars and people to fight the wars. And so they're going to have to make concessions when they tax people with income, and they're going to have to make concessions when they ask people to go and fight. I should have put Michael Klarman's uh, book up here, Unfinished Business. He points out that every single increase uh, in, in uh, political conditions for African Americans in, in the US has been associated with a war. Um, that getting, Af getting them to fight has involved making political concessions. Uh, there again, uh, you, you, know, you have to wonder, well, now when you no longer need large armies to fight wars, uh, you can do it with drones and so forth, maybe that pressure won't be there. And we've been fighting wars for the last two decades on debt. So we don't have to make concessions to the unborn who are going to be paying these debts. So uh, there are these, these different logics. But the upshot for the future, if thinking about the future, is that um, democracy is not inevitable. It depends upon contingent historical struggles. Uh, there's no reason to think it will spring from processes of economic development and modernization. There are conditions under which it will, and we'll talk about, or becomes more likely, and we'll talk about them later, but it's not obvious. Um, even if these economies do falter and wages stagnate and they start to lose legitimacy, they might just become more repressive. There's no obvious reason to think that uh, they will democratize. Perhaps they will, but perhaps they will double down. And in a post-Foucauldian world, this may take the form of what he referred to as the gentle way in punishment rather than uh, throwing large numbers of people into prison. So picture your life in a place where everything you do, what you buy, how you behave, is tracked. The government gives you a score, and the score is a measure of how trustworthy you are as a citizen and determines what you're allowed to do, like ever. <laughs> 
boarding a train, getting a mortgage, all goes back to this score. It's called social credit. The system's eyes are in big data, artificial intelligence, and roughly 200 million surveillance cameras. The scores go from 350 to 950 and are based on habits and behavior. Buy clothes or diapers, it's good. A lot of alcohol, too many video games, not so good. And it's mandatory. When it goes national, social credit scores will be assigned to every one of China's citizens for life. In 2014, the Communist Party called for a system to allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. The model is a place called Rongcheng. It's in Shandong province. It's orderly, streets are spotless, cars slow down, which is unheard of in China. Words like honesty and credibility appear on propaganda posters. Display cases show pictures of Rongcheng's most honored citizens. You start with a thousand points and you can print out your report anytime. You lose points for things like jaywalking, littering, tossing cigarette butts, or spreading rumors. Cameras do a lot of the surveillance work, but it's pretty analog too, like posters that list the ways you can gain or lose points. And each night, local TV shows the surveillance highlights of the day. And then there's Joanne. She's an information collector, a paid enforcer who walks around and writes down deeds about her neighbors. Like the man who carried a drunk person home. Things like this are good deeds, she said. But the farmer overheard swearing and being rude. Yeah, bad deeds. Her quota is 10 a month. She likes the work, thinks the city's better for it. We'll see you on Thursday.